to where I don't have to hear is really great because I'm mostly deaf. So, hi, Ms. K. Hi. Okay. Uh, everybody ready? We're going to talk some serious sea otters here. All right. This presentation is basically talking about things that I've learned through research while working on a film um, that is still in production called Deconstructing Eden, which is about southern sea otters in Elkhorn Slough, Moss Landing, California. A really neat, amazing area. And you want to talk about biodiversity, that, um, that estuary, which Elkhorn Slough is an estuary in California. It's one of the most bioproductive, that is to say, um, it not only has strong biodiversity, but it has a huge amount of life happening in the estuary. And the estuary, of course, is where you have a, a freshwater system that meets with a saltwater uh, water system and comes together. And, and that really provides a neat atmosphere. But the thing was, many years ago, they, uh, the estuary was, was dying, and I'm going to talk about the reason why. A little bit about me. Um, I grew up overseas. I was born in Germany, and my dad was in the Army. That's uh, my dad in the middle there, and the two boys standing in the middle. The little one is me, and the tall guy is my brother. Uh, he was about six feet tall when he was 12 years old, so he was a really tall guy. And, uh, and my mom is on the side there. And my dad, during his Army career, was stationed all over the world. And uh, and we ended up living in places like Korea. I spent six years in Germany, one year in Australia, which is where I learned how to surf. It's also where I, I learned a lot about sharks um, there. And uh, and just neat life experiences that happened that kind of opened my eyes to, to the natural world. This is more about me, um, and, and I'm really not a narcissistic. <laughs> but uh, but I like to I like to let people know what I've done uh, and how I got to where I am today. So you can see in the upper left hand corner is a picture of me 25 years ago when I was in the army. Uh, just got back from Operation Desert Storm. I flew with a helicopter crew with the 101st Airborne Division uh, in combat there. And uh, after serving in the army, I went on to become a teacher. I was a, a second grade teacher and then a third grade teacher respectively for two years in Florida. Um, a few years later, I ended up working in animal rescue, which is the uh, middle picture on the top. Um, I was an animal control officer, animal cop in Washington State uh, for a while. And then I got hit with a disease called Meniere's disease, which is what left me mostly deaf. But the worst part about it, actually, is that it took away my balance and it caused almost daily vertigo attacks for me for about five years straight. Um, not something you want to do when you're trying to pick up, you know, a wild raccoon uh, is to have a vertigo attack and uh, and not be able to feel steady. And, you know, it, it just wasn't conducive to a good work environment. Uh, so I left that and I started, uh, at that time I started freelancing, but I became a journalist, which is really cool because no matter what happened, to my body and my ears, I could still write. And, uh, and this is why uh, everything ties into that. I started working in journalism in uh, 2004, and by 2006, I was picked up as a full-time uh, news reporter for a newspaper in Washington. And, uh, and I would eventually work for about four newspapers on staff. My last two years were with the Tacoma News Tribune, and, uh, and I covered the military for them. And as a photographer, because I was doing photography as well, uh, I got to cover the NFL, professional soccer, Major League Baseball, and hockey. So that was really cool. Um, and that led, and my hearing started to go more and more, and that actually led to me wanting to do something more visual. So I ended up working in films. Um, I started as a consultant to a documentary, and, uh, and that experience actually gave me a huge push to work on the things that I was interested in, which which are animals. And as you see in the top right-hand picture, my first film, Journey Home, uh, was about sea turtles in Florida. And so I spent two years in Florida 
uh, working on that and working on a manatee uh, web series as well. And then, um, and then the bottom left hand corner is a picture that somebody took of, of me and my crew while we were filming uh, Fragile Waters, which was a documentary about southern resident killer whales. And, um, and it actually went on to win Film of the Year down to Dana, Dana Point, California, which is the picture that you see down in the bottom right. At, uh, at FinFest, um, we were in great company because the other winners were the folks from OPS, the Oceanic Preservation Society. Um, you're talking about the folks that made the Cove racing extinction. So it was really neat to be honored with them at the same time. Um, and now that's what I do. So I work on films because I'm deaf as a corn cob. But southern sea otters have always been really close to me. And you're looking at a sea otter in this picture. And he's not a southern sea otter, actually. This is a digitized version of a picture that I took when I was uh, working for Tacoma News Tribune. And his name is Homer. And Homer is no longer with us. Homer passed away a couple of years ago. But Homer was the last surviving sea otter to be rescued from the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And I just lost my video. Can everybody still see me? Everybody there? Am I talking to myself now? Okay. You guys can still see the video, though. Okay. Okay, I can't see it, but that's okay because I hate looking at myself. Um, anyway, Homer was uh, was found up in Alaska, and Homer, oh, no video. Let's, uh, let's see what I can. Huh. Can you see the slides? Okay. Let me, okay, let me keep going with the presentation and I'll mess with the video in a second. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's okay. I don't see my webcam video. On, on here, but let me just continue with the presentation. Uh, so what you're looking at in the slide is, is Homer, and Homer was the last surviving sea otter that was res rescued during the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989. And Homer actually lived out a very full life, but he could never be released back into the wild. Uh, one of the things that he did that was, that was very interesting is he would cuddle with his toys. And actually, you can see a tear falling from his eye. I didn't add that to the picture. That's actually what he did. And sometimes it made me feel like maybe he was remembering things that had happened that were very frightening when he was young. And so he became kind of my, my driving force for my interest in sea otters. Now, the southern sea otters are the ones that range down in California. And you'll see a map of that soon. And, uh, and it'll, it'll show you what what their range is today as well but uh but this is a this is a historical photo from the end of the 1800s and it is basically showing you a pelt two pelts of a beaver and the upper one is a uh is a sea otter and um uh, and they were hunted to near extinction and that's why i have the little asterisk next to the word extinction because it was near extinction the thing is, and this is a crazy story, but the thing is, in 1938, scientists were trying to do a survey of the coastline of California to see if, um, if they could actually create a highway along the coast, and it would later become the Pacific Coast Highway. And in the 1930s, they did all these surveys in different places, and just south of Monterey Bay, they leaned over a cliff and they looked down. And then remember, they thought sea otters were extinct at this time. And there were 40 sea otters in the water down below them. And, um, and so when you have a group of sea otters together, it's called a raft. And this raft was the last remaining raft of sea otters in California. 
And here's why. So this is a graph that shows you um, the amount of sea otters that were killed throughout the years leading up until the late 1800s. And it spikes in the early 1800s, it spikes. They were taking more than 23,000 sea otters a year. Keep that number in mind, 23,000 killed for the fur trade a year. And I want you to keep that in mind because we're gonna talk about what their numbers are today. And as you can see, that number dropped. And then it dropped and it kind of came back up and then it dropped all the way down. And that's when they thought the sea otters were extinct because they didn't see them anymore. And this is that range. So every city that you see indicated on this map is where there used to be and are now coming back sea otter populations in California. And, uh, and that's the Southern Sea Otter Range. And the traditional range, I should, should add, traditional range actually went up into uh, Oregon. And the Northern Sea Otters actually ranged all the way down into Washington. And there was a little crossover. And that range hasn't been fully reestablished yet. But one of the things that helped is they created national marine sanctuaries. So Monterey Bay, one of the largest ones in California, um, fully protected area. And there was uh, absolutely nothing that uh, that could be done to uh, to affect the health of marine mammals in the marine sanctuary after the sanctuary was created. And that helped the numbers come back. And so the, the otters ended up coming back to Elkhorn Slough. And this is the, the, the really crazy thing. Elkhorn Slough by the 1980s was in such a bad state, which was full of pollution. It, um, it was known as a dead zone, even though it was an estuary and it was supposed to be really biodiverse and have all these animals and life happening. Um, there was very few things that could live in those waters and, uh, and around the waters because the waters were so polluted and nasty and toxic and algae, uh, algal blooms happening. And, uh, and the sea otters came back, and we'll talk about that too later. So right now they're at 3,000 and holding steady. And remember when I told you to hold on to that number of 23,000 killed per year in the 1800s? 3,000 is impressive when you look at the fact that we started with only 40 remaining sea otters in the 1930s, and they're now back up to 3,000. But they've kind of plateaued. They're not going up in numbers. And I'm going to try to restart the video again, so bear with me. Items on their menu board they can choose from. And, um, and they're not tied to any one specific thing. And so they can eat sea urchins, they can eat mussels, they can eat crabs, they can eat sometimes. And there's current, <laughs> I press buttons is what I do. Um, there's current threats to sea otters. And this is kind of important. So one of the threats that gets blamed, uh-oh, dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. Yes. It's a great white shark, and, uh, and apparently fur for my cat. But the great white shark is, is kind of a, a scapegoat, and that's a term that means basically it's being blamed for something it's not really doing. And, uh, okay, that's, that's fine. We, uh, if Deb can run the video for the great white sharks, then we'll take a look at the great white sharks. Okay, cool, cool. And it's a 40 second clip. And basically I, I just narrated it over the, the microphone so you can understand what was going on. Oh, here we go, There's something happening. So what you're seeing here is the uh, Farallon Islands, about 25 miles off the coast of San Francisco. And the great oh, white shark quiet. that you'll see in this clip has just made a kill of an elephant seal. And uh, it was a little ways out and we came up on it uh, via the boat. 
and what I found very interesting is um, part of part of the research was to find out, you know, are they really going after sea otters? Because that's kind of a small hairy meal for them to go after. So I also wanted to see for myself what the behavior was like. And as you can see, when it makes this kill or she, whatever it was, uh, when it makes this kill, it's very methodical. There's no frenzy. And uh, it, it's a very intelligent being at work. Okay, so the video is over, and uh, correct. Everybody saw the sharks. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, part of what I wanted to do when I started working on the film was figure out: Are the great white sharks actually the reason why the sea otters are dying? And yes, sort of. It was found that sea otters were washing up dead but their bodies were fully intact with one singular bite mark with the radius of a great white shark. And essentially what they learned, what scientists learned had happened is that great white sharks were indeed biting the otters and then spitting them out because they're giant hairballs. And the thing is, the uh, sea otters were washing up intact, and they were able to, to take a look at them, and they found a bigger problem happening. And we're going to talk about that problem. That problem is down on the list. So then I looked at something I had already studied. And I don't know if you guys can see me, <laughs> but I'm holding up a killer whale. And um, the type of killer whale that attacks marine mammals, there's fish-eating killer whales and there's mammal-eating killer whales, the type of killer, killer whales that, that attack uh, marine mammals are transient or big whales. And there's a lot of big whales off the coast of California. And they, too, are a little bit bitey when it comes to sea otters. But th their amount of uh, kills on sea otters are very low. Then there were humans. And I find this hard to believe. Well, not hard to believe. I just find it hard to understand. Um, but there are actually humans out there that poach sea otters. That is to say, they go out and they shoot them. Doesn't happen very often, but over the past few years, there's been a handful of shootings. And then some people, um, you know, drive their boats very quickly in areas where sea otters are rafting, where they're resting, and they hit them and it causes injuries or death. So there's humans, but then there's domestic cats. And you're like, what? And I'll get to that in a moment. But domestic cats turn out to be the biggest reason for sea otter mortality. And this is kind of a story that hasn't been told. Let's talk about human impact. Oh, I don't want to let this go. Ocean acidification. This is what's happening due to global climate change. Um, as we know, the climate is changing. And one of the, the biggest, most profound impacts of that is the uh, oceans are changing. Not only the temperature, not only the sea level, but the composition of the oceans is changing as well. And when this happens um, in the form of ocean acidification, that is to say more, for lack of a better term, more acidic uh, properties entering that water and not being, not being broken down before they can affect marine life, uh, it, it's having a damaging effect on shellfish. And otters eat a lot of shellfish. Actually, otters prey select. That means that if you think of it in terms of McDonald's, when they drive up to the, to the menu board, there's 51 to 60 items on their menu board they can choose from. And, um, and they're not tied to any one specific thing. And so they can eat sea urchins, they can eat mussels, they can eat crabs, they can eat. Sometimes they, they do crazy things and, and try to eat, you know, octopus. Um, but but mostly it's shellfish and ocean acidification is going to change the availability of large shellfish so and we're not sure how that's going to happen because as you can see in this graphic the shells start to decalcify they get broken down uh, because of the acidic nature of the water the chemical properties and as that breaks down it doesn't allow the organism that's inside of it to mature and that could be a huge problem. And if it happens too rapidly, 
it can actually destroy entire forms of shellfish life. That's a human impact. And uh, and just to show you how much they love their, their clams and their, their shellfish, uh, this was an otter I filmed back in October in Moss Landing that not only had one clam, but he decided to take the whole group of them. He carried his buffet with him everywhere he went. He had food on the go. Now, domestic cats. And the little black cat you see in the bottom right-hand corner is my cat, Penny. And if she hops up here, I'll hold her up and let you see her. Um, she does not, as far as I know, have Toxoplasma gondii, which is the parasite that we're going to talk about. And Toxoplasma gondii was identified in 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, as something that could not only affect uh, marine mammals, but it actually had an effect on human beings. When you pick up a, uh, those of you who have cats at home or you know somebody who has cats, when you pick up a, a thing of kitty litter, there's a warning. If you turn around to the back, there's a warning on the back that says that pregnant women and people with compromised immune systems should not handle uh, litter, kitty litter, soil litter. And the reason for that is because of this parasite called Toxopla Toxoplasma gondii. And what it does is still not fully known, but here's how it's affecting the sea otters that we know so far. It gets into their brains. And as it gets into their brains, it affects different behaviors. One of the things that, that seems to be very common is that as it gets into their brains and they have the infection for a long amount of time, they start making bad choices. And in this next slide, you'll see kind of how that plays out. So the video that I watched took place, can you see my pointer, my mouse pointer? No? Okay. Um, on the map that you see there, there's a red circle, and there's a little group of islands, and those are the Farallon Islands. And the Farallons are where the great white sharks that I filmed, the one that you saw in the, in the video, that's where they come on an annual basis to hang out around a elephant seal rookery, where the elephant seals come to give birth and mate and hang out in big numbers. And there's California sea lions out there, and it's all very uh, amazing. I mean, it's just just this weird uh, environment because it's out 25 miles off the coast of California. It's off the coast of San Francisco. And that arrow that I added, this yellow arrow with the wavy line in it, is kind of how the sea otters' brains get messed up. And instead of hanging out, in the three to five mile radius that they normally hang out to find food, they swim out 25, 30 miles into the open ocean. And they get out there and they're just kind of lost because they don't know where to go. And that's how they run into the great white sharks who just come by and they see a floating furball and they're like, oh, maybe that's a seal. And they chomp on it and they're like, eh, that's a hairball. And they spit it back out. And this, this is the number one natural cause of mortality for sea otters is being bitten by great white sharks right now. And it's not the shark's fault. <laughs> it's the little parasite that comes from domestic cats, which enters that estuary water system through sewers, through storm drains, through outfall, um, that is to say water that, that just runs off different things. You know, there's a lot of farmland around that area, a lot of uh, houses, people living out there. And, uh, and it just ends up in the water system. So scientists did a study where they found that in Elkhorn Slough, there were 82% infection rate of the 45 otters that they studied. So 82% of them were positive for Toxoplasma gondii, which is a huge number. And it's a huge problem. So what I'm working on now with, uh, with, the film that I'm that I'm working on is exposing that truth, and uh, and trying to come up with some solutions. So let's talk a little bit more about what they face. You see, it's not just it's not just parasites. It's not just great white sharks. It's not just all of these things that I've talked about. They live in a marine environment, which means they come across toxins. 
man-made toxins. They come across uh, pesticides. They're they're surrounded by farmland, so it just dumps whenever there's rain. And and there's actually been a huge drought in California for the past five years. But when it does rain, that water washes the uh, the, the herbicides and the pesticides into the estuary, and it moves up through the food chain. Um, not only in bioaccumulation, that is the total accumulation of toxins in the environment, but it does a thing called uh, biomagnification, which is where you start with the little organism that gets eaten by the bigger organism, and it adds to their toxicity, and then that gets eaten by a bigger organism, and they become more toxic and so on. So when you get to the, the marine mammals, you get to the top of that, and that biomagnification is pretty profound. Um, here in Washington State, when we were talking about, in Fragile Waters, my other film, when we were talking about the southern resident killer whales, we learned that they were one of the most absolutely toxic marine mammals out there. So toxic that you almost have to protect yourself when they wash up after they, they pass away. If they wash up and, and somebody wants to, scientists go out to examine it, and they have to cut it open, they're very careful not to come in contact with bodily fluids for that reason. So there's a lot of problems that still face them. They're very much still in danger, and they need protection. Oh, but wait, <laughs> we were talking about superheroes. Hi, Reggio. Um, sea otters are superheroes. They're absolutely superheroes. There's no denying this. This is amazing. This is the stuff, when I learned this stuff, I was like, these are the coolest animals ever. They, they're they just amazing. We're going to start with this. It's a very sad picture, but this is part of why they're superheroes. So what you're looking at is a yearling, uh, a California sea lion yearling at the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito, which is near San Francisco. And it came into the center alive, and it ended up passing away. And it was starving when it came in. And the starvation issue is huge because um, the sea lion population every year gets affected by this. Right now, they are just in the middle of their pupping season down in California, and, uh, and it's happening again. Last year was a record year for rescues and a record year for losses, and it's happening once again. So the way that the, the otters become superheroes in all this is because a lot of these sea lions are affected by demoic acid toxicity. Now, this is a toxin found in algae. And algae toxins are really crazy because they affect your neural system, your neurological systems. And, um, and it's pretty intense. Um, I worked on a web series about manatees in Florida in 2012 and 2013. They lost 859 manatees in less than a year. About 90% of those losses were due to, to algal uh, toxicity, algal bloom toxicity. And, um, and so I have a little bit of background. So what happens with demoic acid is this too gets into the brain, but it gets into the neurological systems. It affects the muscles. It affects the respiratory systems. Um, in the manatees, it was causing them literally just to stop being able to breathe and all marine mammals are air breathers, and so they would drown in the water. Their bodies would be found in perfect condition, except for the fact that they drowned. How it affects sea lions is a little different. And these are a little bit frightening, sad, whatever you want to call it, um, but, but very much poignant pictures. Uh, the, the bottom two are the most important. The one on the left-hand side, bottom left, is a California sea lion that I photographed and I filmed in Moss Landing that was moving his head from side to side like this. And there is a video that I have that could show you this, but I'm not gonna ask Debbie to run it right now. Uh, running a little bit behind on this presentation, so I wanna give time for questions at the end. But, um, but the, the sea lions lose motor coordination, um, they foam at the mouth, and in the worst case, it absolutely just uh, kills them outright. And so what you see on the bottom right is also something that I filmed in 2014. I started the preparatory work for Deconstructing Eden. I 
was on a beach with about eight dead sea lions. And they had all died very, very rapidly, and, uh, and nobody could clear them off the beach yet. And, uh, and it was very sad, but it also was what drove me to make, uh, start making this film. Now, the pneumonic acid toxicity is caused by the algae. And what happens is algae blooms where there's a lot of nutrients, and especially nitrate, concentrated nutrients. Nitrates are things that, uh, well, they, they, they bond. And because they bond, they make food for algae, and, and algae just starts to grow like crazy. And one of the things that we introduce into the environment that has a lot of nitrates is fertilizer. And, uh, and so remember when I said that Elkhorn Slough is surrounded by farm fields. You can imagine that fertilizer from all these large farm fields, great stuff too, strawberries, artichokes, I mean, really yummy stuff. But all this fertilizer dumps into the water, and that water starts to, to get higher concentrations of nitrates. And those nitrates create algal blooms. And when the algal blooms happen, they can be deadly, and a lot of them will contain domoic acid and affect the sea otters. I'm going to take this question that I see, what first got me interested in, stud in studying otters. It was actually the otter that I had uh, done a story on as a newspaper uh, reporter back in Tacoma, and it was a northern sea otter. His name was Homer, and he was at the uh, Point Defiance Zoo, and he was the last survivor that was rescued and brought back to health from the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1989. And I did a story right before he passed, and he's passed away. But he passed away at old age, so it's not necessarily a horribly sad story. Um, but, uh, but I got really interested in him because, and I know it sounds silly, but he had a very different personality than other sea otters that were very playful and, and thrashing around in the water. He, uh, he was very calm, very serene, almost as it was as if he was happy just to be there. And, uh, and so then I started working on other, other projects and films, and then I ended up doing Fragile Waters and went down to Monterey, and for the first time in my life, I saw sea otters in the wild, and that did it. And when I came across this, the slide that you're looking at right now, when I came across the threats, the problems that are faced, by the marine mammals and moss landing in Elkhorn Slough, I knew I had to do something about it. The world needs to hear the story. Um, they really do, because there's something we can all do about it. And moving on, sea otters are superheroes because they prevent algal blooms. How they do that is because of what they like to eat. I'm sorry, but the sea otter superpower, it's in their tummies. They eat, and they eat a lot of stuff. And what they choose to eat helps the environment. So how they prevent algal blooms is they actually remove up to about 400,000 crabs from Elkhorn Slough. The less crabs that are in the slough means that there's more of the orange sea slugs, which is what the crabs eat. When you take away the crabs, you get more slugs. Well, the sea slugs eat algae. Remember how I said back in the 1980s before the otters came back to Elkhorn Slough? It was pretty much like dead water and algal blooms and all this stuff. Yeah, the otters came back and they cleaned that place up. They cleaned it up through their stomachs. They ate their way to a better environment, and that's their biggest superpower. Otters also help restore kelp beds, and this is what's ironic. Kelp is actually a, a, a form of, of algae in itself. It's not a plant. It's not an animal, uh, and, um, but it looks a lot like a plant. And the kelp that I'm talking about are long, stringy uh, strands that are, that are around California. And there used to be a lot of kelp forests. And kelp forests are great because it helps small animals hide from bigger animals. Again, when these guys come around, you want some place to hide, especially if you're yummy. And that's what kelp forests were great for. But when the otters were hunted to extinction or near extinction, the uh, sea urchins took over. And the sea urchins didn't have to worry about predators because nothing really outside of otters were eating them. <laughs> and so the sea urchins would attach themselves to the base of the kelp and eat the kelp from the base, which would cause the kelp to go floating away. And that base where the kelp came from, remember, kelp is not an actual plant. It's kind of a weird in-between organism. 
it never grew back. So when the base was was eaten, the kelp stopped growing, and they could eat an entire kelp forest in just a few days. So what they did is, um, is the sea otters came back, and they started they started eating the sea urchins. And uh, like you know, like I say here, sea ur urchins are like happy meals to them, and uh, and it helped the urchin populations decline. And now the sea urchins have adapted back to avoiding sea otters, which means they eat the tops of kelp rather than the base. I have a question from Miss K. He says, "What do you think is the best quality of an otter?" It's definitely they are the chill masters. Otters can relax and chill out like no other animal in the world, period. Um, they they love, they spend a lot of time eating, but they spend a lot of time floating on their backs, and they do that very well. <laughs> um, they, they, are, they are fun to watch. I love being around sea otters. I've spent now, in the past few years, I've spent about 60 hours around sea otters, and um, God, they're just amazing, just absolutely. They're very intelligent. Uh, they can be a little snarky. Everything's really cute for walls. Um, they will occasionally, for no particular reason, attack and kill seabirds and not eat them. Nobody knows why. I think they're just a little territorial, and seabirds get on their nerves because they make a lot of noise and they're trying to sleep. Uh, but otters chill. Oh, we'll see that. So to wrap this up with the algae part of it, they prevent harmful algal blooms from happening and they save the kelp forest which is what you see here the otter and kelp forest um, which helps bring back other animals in a safe environment allows them to to retreat from predators it's really amazing uh that they do that and again it's all tied to their tummies and what they like to eat they also aid in keeping seagrass healthy um, because of what they eat <laughs> I can't give you a better answer. They eat a lot of stuff. And um, and what happens with that is back in the estuary, that's where sharks go to breed, like the lemon sharks and rays actually go back into the estuary and they give birth, live birth out there. And it's a safe environment. And because that seagrass is back there, it's great for little baby sharks to swim around and not get eaten by fish. They are total superheroes. The bottom line, and this slide is a. Oh, I've got another question from Bridget. Uh, what is the difference between northern and, and southern sea otter populations? Okay, northern sea otter populations are the ones that were traditionally ranged from the Russian Bering Strait down to Washington State. And southern sea otters kind of picked up at Oregon northern Oregon coast all the way down to Mexico, the tip of northern Mexico shore, Baja area. And uh, But now we have a northern sea otter population that's about 120,000 sea otters. They came back really well from hunting. Um, a lot of that is due to the environment that they're in being really, uh, really good for them to, to have stayed away from hunters more. And their population was larger to start with. The southern sea otters are uh, are far more endangered. Uh, Follow-up question: Can they crossbreed, or are they different subspecies? Yes, but they don't cross paths. What ended up happening is when they tried, when they did efforts to actually bring the sea otter populations back, they did what's called translocation. So scientists took groups of southern sea otters and they put them in Washington State in Oregon, which was cool. And the southern sea otters said, no, thank you. And a lot of them actually swam back to California and um, or died along the way. They didn't, they didn't create populations here. We do get occasional sea otters, uh, mostly off of Vancouver Island, um, but they're probably northern sea otters and, uh, because northern sea otters just have that huge number, like I said, 120,000. So, uh, but yes, biologically they could crossbreed. They they're not known to because they're not known geographically to cross paths. There's there's a wide space between Oregon and northern Washington where there's not sea otters hanging out. 
the, but going back to the slide, the bottom line is that they are they're the keystone species. Keystone species, great term. Keystone is something that has to be there for things to be built on top of it. And the southern sea otters are keystone species for all of the life in Monterey Bay. And that even includes human beings. Um, the water quality and everything that, that I talked about, algal blooms, um, these are things that affect human beings as well. I want to talk about ways to help because I really don't want to run out of time on this. Uh, okay. We're not going to go out and, and solve algal blooms and domoic acid toxicity tomorrow. Uh, scientists are working on that, and there are things in the works that might help. But here's the, here's the problem. A lot of people forget that they can start at home. And I mean, <laughs> right where you live, right now, today, right in your classroom, uh, water usage. Even if, you, even if you're mindful of cutting back just a second or two, of how long you let the faucet run, how long you're in the shower, it adds up. It's it's exponential, you know, because if you're doing it and your friends do it, that number just booms. It goes crazy. Water, fresh water. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Water is a big deal. When when I did my last film, I didn't call it fragile orchids. I called it fragile waters, because the water is the key. We have a planet that's mostly covered in water. And less than 3% of that water is something that we could possibly drink. And there are 7 billion people. And there are millions who die every year because they have no access to clean water. Water use is critical. And we take it for granted here because we turn on a tap and get fresh water, unless you live in Flint, Michigan. That was a bad joke. Uh, but... Water is critical, and it's going to get more critical, especially as sea level rises, because we're losing we're losing uh, access to frozen fresh water, which is just dumping into the ocean, becoming salinated. Uh, plastic use, though, this is the one I implore you, I beg you. This is easy. I'm not asking you to to change your clothing style. I'm not asking you to become a, a vegan or a vegetarian, but plastic use. We all do it. We do it daily. It's huge. The one thing I'm going to tell you is coming up in a moment. Um, you can refuse certain plastics when you don't need them. I understand when you're on the go and you get something and it's covered in plastic, you have no control over that. But there are times when people offer you plastic and you can say no, and I'll show you that in a minute. Educating other, others is just simply turning around and starting the conversation. You don't have to have the answers. You just have to have an avenue to get the answers. So you can go to your teachers, you can go to librarians, you can contact me uh, through through my film websites for answers that, that, that you need, um, but educate other people because, because you're, you're not just a student or you're not just a teacher, you're not just a filmmaker, you're not just whatever. We're human beings that inhabit this planet together and we have to cohabitate. So educating others, is really cool. Getting involved. We all live around watersheds. So it's really cool. Getting involved. We all live around watersheds. So when I talk about watersheds, I'm talking about the creek behind my house. I'm talking about the ocean. I'm talking about lakes. Keeping those clean is a huge thing. And you don't have to organize a big cleanup. It's just a matter of being mindful while you're out there. If you see trash, pick it up. Secure it, bring it someplace where you can properly dispose of it. This is what our world is starting to look like. This is an image of plastic that washed up after a high tide in a part of the world that hugs the Pacific Ocean. This plastic came from everywhere. It came from Taiwan, it came from the United States, it came from Hawaii, it came from Alaska, Canada. This is our world. It's estimated that within 50 years, almost 50% of the mass that's moving in our oceans is going to be plastic debris. That's a huge thing because they will outnumber the amount of biomass hanging out in the oceans. I hope that doesn't happen. And to keep that from happening, 
this is where you start. Top left, straws. Every time you go to a restaurant, somebody's going to come up, they're going to bring you a glass, and hopefully the straw in a paper wrapper. You don't have to open that wrapper. You can hand the straw back to them and say, no, thanks, I don't need it. You take a glass, that's amazing, because the human body's made this way, and you drink out of it. It is really cool. It's the easiest way to do this. If you can start doing that and you keep remembering to do it, you'll find that you do it all the time. And pretty soon, people around you pick it up too. I started doing it. My wife and I didn't talk about it, but now she does it too. Just don't need to have the plastic straws. Why are plastic straws bad? Well, they get in the environment and they're small, but they don't break down. And animals ingest them. Animals actually have been found... Uh, sea turtles have been found with plastic straws all the way stuck up their nose. Um, when I was doing my sea turtle documentary in Florida, one of the sea turtles died at the rescue center, and they did a necropsy, which was like an autopsy, but for animals, and they cut it open to find out why it died. And they opened its stomach, they found 234 pieces of plastic, half of those were straws, the other half were what's in that middle picture, which are plastic uh, bags, grocery bags, um, which is something else we can say no. It's very easy to use a recyclable bag, or if you just buy one or two items, just carry it. I know people look at you weird. You don't want a bag. They'll get used to it. It's not a big deal. But if you take a couple bags out of circulation, you are literally saving lives. You take straws out of circulation, you are literally saving lives. The bottom right-hand corner looks and reminds us all of really neat things in our childhood, sometimes very meaningful things. Um, as a soldier, I knew um, soldiers who got killed in combat, and their families would tie notes to them and put them on a string of a helium balloon. They would do a balloon release to send messages to their loved ones. And that's a beautiful idea. The problem is those balloons don't go up to to heaven. They don't go out of the atmosphere. They go up a few miles and then they burst or they drift and they eventually end up on the ground or in the water and they too get ingested. They don't break down. There's no such thing as a truly immediately biodegradable anything uh, unless it's organically made. And, uh, and so things that are made out of plastic stay in the environment for a long, long time. I just, I, that's, if, if I can ask you guys to do anything, please start with this, because this is something we can all do. The world doesn't need more heroes. The world needs everyone to be heroic when called upon. You look around you. There's something right in front of you that can benefit from your helping hands. You do it, and then you look around, and you start again. That's my mantra. Those are my words. That's what I tell people when I speak publicly. I am not a hero. I want to be among a group of heroes. I want to be among a culture that does heroic things. What we do today creates our tomorrow. This is you. This is every single person on this planet. It's me. It's you. It's us working together. I can't, I can't state that highly enough. Above all, as I end the slide presentation, I'm going to open this up to questions. But I thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours about sea otters because we just touched the tip of the iceberg on these furry little awesome guys. But the reality is there's a bigger story. And Deconstructing Eden is going to be the first film ever to cover this huge, huge story. I appreciate uh, very kind words from everybody, and and I dedicated my life to helping marine mammals and animals uh, because we're all connected. I, I'll back up so everybody can see my shirt. <laughs> the graphic on here is made up of a lot of different animals, and it really symbolizes us as an ecosystem. I I thank all of you for tuning in, and I'm going to open this up to questions. It can be questions about the environment. It can be questions about sea otters, uh, sea lions, great white sharks, 
Uh, and please feel free to ask anything. Thank you, Deb. I appreciate that. Now, if if we run out of questions, I can show you another video that Deb could run for you. Um, okay, questions coming in. Elgin High School, uh, do you have any thoughts on GMO fish? Yes, I do. GMO, let's, let's talk about what a genetically modified organism is. It's something that, uh, that right now covers a lot of ground. Um, corn, bananas are GMOs, and, uh, but in a simpler sense, because these things, when found in the wild, were not the edible big fruit and vegetables that we know today. They had to be crossbred and certain genetics spread out of them to modify them to become edible. Bananas, actually, if you find bananas in the wild in South America, they're about yay big, and they're just chock full of nutty seeds that you can't chew. That had to be bred out of them. Uh, but when it comes to animal life, when we talk about genetic modifications, mostly we're talking about introducing things that work for one animal and introducing it into genetics into another animal so that they become healthier, stronger, bigger, or more meaty. That's not necessarily a bad thing. However, it really needs to be studied for a long time before we all raise our hands up and say, yes, I'm going to eat the super genetically modified salmon. Because um, we don't know what the ramifications or what can happen in the future of genetically modified animals is. And that's a, that's a problematic area. So my, my thoughts on GMO fish specifically is, okay, it needs to be studied. It really does. And it's not necessarily going to end up being the, the answer that everybody's looking for. Um, we need to make sure it's safe. So Ms. K asked, do I study all kinds of otters? Informally, yes. I'm also a member of the Marine Stranding Network here in Whatcom County. Um, so I have a, a, a strong uh, tie to the river otter. Um, and then that's what I see here where I live. I live about a mile from Drayton Harbor. Uh, I got harbor seals, river otters out there. Uh, so, yes, I do study other types of otters. Sea otters, southern sea otters by far, just I can't get enough of them. They are amazing. Every time I go out to watch them, they do new things. Um, they're surprising scientists with their new behaviors. Uh, for example, they haul out now because of global warming. They haul out for hours at a time and hang out on the beach. That goes against six million years of evolution that have told the sea otter, the scientific name is an hydrolutris, which means otter in the water, to stay in the water. And the reason they're hauling out on the beach is it's uh, energy cost effective to keep them warm much more than staying in the water and putting their paws and tail out of the water, which is what you see them do a lot to warm up. They don't have blubber, by the way. Sea otters do not have a blubber layer. layer. They have dense fur. That fur is about one million hairs per square inch dense. And that fur is all that protects them from the cold water of the Pacific. Uh, Valerie says, okay. <laughs> Lauren, movie expected to be, when is Deconstructing Eden expected to be released? Good question. Um, I, am, I will finish the film before the end of the year. Whether or not that means it gets a distribution before the end of the year is unknown to me at this time. Right now, I want this film to be in museums and certain aquariums, that is to say aquariums that don't do entertainment with captive cetaceans. Um, I want that to be where the film really, really goes. So it's educational. Bridget says, what can we do about dead zones? Oh, eutrophic zones. I even left that out. Um, and should we restrict fertilizer usage? On the fertilizer usage, that is a battle. That is a huge battle. Because in California, especially dealing with an ongoing drought scenario, uh, fertilizers 
are being introduced in heavier amounts than they ever have been traditionally because they need to make the most of the, the growing season. And, um, and there's already people on the ground fighting that. Um, restricting fertilizer use to me is, is a great thing for the, for the animals and it's a really bad thing for the farmers. So we need to find something that works better um, than the nitrate fertilizers that we use that helps the farmers still grow their vegetables and helps the environment not have algal blooms. And as far as the, the eutrophic zones, the dead zones, we need more otters. <laughs> it sounds so silly, but it's true. You have to remember, and I showed a graphic earlier, we were killing in the 1800s 23,000 otters a year. So their population number must have been at least double that in California. And we're at 3,000 otters right now, this tiny number. If we can expand that, they can protect the environment. They are superheroes. They will protect the environment naturally. Uh, Elgin High School says, what do you think people should, I'm sorry, what do you think should people have exotic pets? And their effect on the, oh, on the ecosystem. Okay, exotic pets, as a former animal control officer, let me say this. I never ran into a person with an exotic pet that actually had the proper environment for the animals that they had. I had a college student who had a caiman, which is a small crocodile, in her bathtub. I had a guy who decided to breed a wolf and a husky and keep the wolf pups in his apartment. Um, <laughs> these animals are not pets. Cats and dogs, domestic cats and dogs that we live with are animals that have tens of thousands of years of experience of living with us and living within our domicile, even back when we lived in huts and tents. Um, they're adapted to that. They, they, they need us as much as we need them, and that's great. But exotic animals are, by definition, animals that were wild. And, um, and have not been domesticated. So it's a very negative impact, especially if you release them. They become invasive species. I grew up in Florida after my dad got out of the Army. And they're dealing with monkeys. <laughs> they're dealing with anacondas now. They're dealing with all these crazy animals that Florida didn't have before people got them as pets and let them go. Uh, what species you studied is your favorite? Sea otters, hands down. You gotta love these guys. How in the world can you not love a sea otter? They're uber cool. They also are super intelligent. I didn't get to show or talk about that very much. Uh, the mother and pup bond is so strong, and they use tools. I knew a I knew a mother sea otter that actually used a coke bottle, that a broken coke bottle, as a tool to pry uh, pry clams. And she kept it under a skin flap, right? And she had a daughter. And when that daughter was born, she showed her daughter how to do that. Now her daughter's out there swimming around. She's got a Coke bottle under her flap, and she uses it to pry clams open. It's very cool. Uh, what is the Otter's Contribution Society? They're a keystone species. Any environment that they're in is going to benefit from them being there. You take them out of that environment, the environment starts to degrade itself. We live in a time where we can't run the risk of degrading environments any further than we already have, period. That's um, so important. And apex predators, so you're talking great white sharks, you're talking killer whales, are the same. We can't let sharks die. We can't let killer whales go extinct. The environment won't recover from that. Well, I mean, it will. You'll have oceans of algae and jellyfish. Any other questions? I'm so glad you guys took the time today to uh, to tune in and uh, and hear me ramble on about sea otters. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This is really cool. Thank you, Miss Kay's class. You guys keep it cool. Bridget, Lauren, of course, Valerie, thank you, Elgin High, 
You guys rock. Oh my gosh. I have been gushing about you folks. There's no more question. I'm going to go eat my breakfast. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do this again. Put me on the roster for next year. I'll do something cooler. I'll make sure the video works. Maybe we can uh, work bits of deconstructing in, into it more. So, Oh, please, go out there, Facebook, Deconstructing Eden, follow the film. I, I mean that because while I'm filming, I'll actually be doing live broadcasts um, like I did in October. I went out for a research trip for two weeks in October, and, um, and, and I did uh, Periscope. So while I was out there, I could turn it around. You would see the sea otters right in front of me while I'm filming. Uh, beautiful environment out there. And you're live with me out in the field. I'll be doing that again. I'm going to be filming from April 8th through April 23rd, I think. And uh, you know, I'll try to periscope every day and, uh, and keeping up with it on Facebook. I'll be posting pictures and information. Uh, yeah, Deconstructing Eden is, I hope, going to take on a, a really good following. And that message just needs to get out there. Um, I really hope to be able to do what I did today in a larger scope with the film. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I will, um, educationally speaking, I will probably try to throw out a secret link to the screener as soon as I finish the film to Yellow Oceans, who are my fiscal sponsors. Not financial sponsors, but fiscal sponsors of the film. And, um, and hopefully classrooms can start watching it uh, free of charge online pretty much as soon as I get done with it. Toodles, guys. Bye.